from the null questions, the last by null questions. When did you first become conscious of the fact that you're a spiritual being? Oh. <laughs> These are just words being thrown around. Essentially, well, Essentially, spirituality means something beyond your physical nature it comes into your experience. Is there anybody who doesn't have it? There's no such thing. Because what's physical about us, what's psychological about us is all gathered from outside. So obviously there's something more to it. So when did I become conscious of that? That's a question, time. Well, I think it happened in small bits and pieces in many ways, right from probably thirteen, fourteen years of age. But always, always you will find a logic in your mind to beat it down. So I was logically very strong and I beat it down all the time. So the age of twenty-five it exploded in such a big, big is not the word, in such a cosmic proportion that my logic got beaten down. So you can say twenty-five and I've stayed that way. Twenty-five, even the doctors are saying my cellular age is only twenty-five <laughs> You were in India one day, New York Fashion Week the next day, Harvard in the weekend, how… Sometimes I do those things on the same day also. On the same day also. <laughs> <laughs> You're surrounded by so many different kinds of energy, um, that, you know, of, of all kinds. Um, how do you not let it affect you? How do you not take in what you don't want to take in? How do you manage the transitions? How do you maintain your equilibrium? Uh, there's nothing that I don't want to take in. I'm okay with everything. I'm not in conflict with anything for that matter. Well, uh, only yesterday you saw me with fashion people <laughs> but otherwise I'm with, uh, you know, in tribal villages, in the most affluent segments of the society, with scientists, with academics, with totally illiterate farmers, mm -hmm. with uh, hardcore criminals in the prisons. I have no issue with anything around me because who I am, what I am, how I am is never determined by what's around me. This is the significance of being human. All other creatures adapt to their surroundings. A human being can craft and create his surroundings. That's what being conscious means. Your interest in fashion, um, well firstly, what, what in your estimation is fashion? What is it? See, uh, all… most creatures in the world came with either furs or scales or feathers or something. We came a little bare <laughs> So inevitably, even to protect ourselves, if not for aesthetic purposes, even to protect ourselves, we need something more. We don't have enough uh, scales or feathers or hair or anything to really protect us in various situations that we could exist in. So clothing came. Because when we talk about a human being, from the smallest thing in our life to everything, we always want to be better than who we are right now. In that effort, one of the things that happened was clothing. We always try to make it better. A piece of, uh, I don't know, maybe you see Adam and Eve with uh, two leaves or three leaves. That's basic clothing, pretty good <laughs> Pretty good. I mean, in terms of basic purpose, it serves the purpose. 
then maybe uh, some skin of an animal or something, we carved ourselves. But we want to make it better and better. So in trying to make it better, this word fashion came. That because everybody does not know how to make it better for themselves, if I am looking at you as some kind of a aesthetic guide to me, if you do something, I think that is fashion and I also want to do something, the same thing rather. So fashion is a consequence of a whole lot of people not knowing what to do to improve their appearance. So if somebody that they look up to does a certain thing, everybody starts doing the same thing. But now there was a time there would only be probably one iconic person in a society. Today in different arenas of uh, activity, there are different icons. So every season you have to come up with new fashion because nobody knows what to hold on to. <laughs> You have a very strong opinion on the type of cloth that people wear? No, um, I don't have a strong opinion. It is… Uh, I'm just listening to the planet. If we don't listen to Mother Earth, what she is speaking, we will be a disaster. It's not my opinion that everybody should wear natural fiber. That's what the Earth is speaking. And um, yesterday you spoke a little bit about how much plastic is in, uh, in traditional, non-natural sort of uh, run-of-the-mill fashion, how much, uh, how the focus shouldn't be on the plastic bag, but it should be on clothing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? See, plastic bag is a very visible evil. You can see it floating around, so you know you must do something about it. But the polyfiber that you're wearing, the synthetic fiber that you're using, it is… it is being disseminated in a microfiber. That is something that you cannot see. A evil that you cannot see is always far more dangerous than a evil that you can see. Visible things, we will come to our senses and learn to handle it at some point. But invisible evil just spreads and it could be too late before we can do anything. So, it is already… we're pretty advanced in getting plastic into everything. Plastic is not the crime. Plastic is a fantastic material, all right? Because you can use and reuse it a thousand times if you want. You don't have to go on exploiting earth if everything was plastic. But our body is organic. We don't have a plastic body. So what should be in touch with this? This is a very… clothing is an intimate thing. Mm -hmm. It's closer to us than most people in our lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all the time with us, isn't it? So when something is so intimately in contact with you, it must be of the nature of the earth because it must be closer to our own nature. You can't take something from somewhere which is very different from the nature of our own body and put it on it. The same goes for food because it gets into us. It must be as close to our nature as possible. Everything that we have built, our bone, flesh and blood, everything is from the soil out of which we have eaten. So it's best that things which are intimately close to us are like this. You can make your car totally plastic one day, it will be good because you can fully recycle the entire car when you're done with it. Recycling metal is far more difficult because of various types of metals. Plastic, also various types are there but very easily you can reduce it to one or two varieties and easily recycle the whole thing. Your windows, here now everywhere it's turning plastic, it's a good thing because you can pull it out one day and recycle the whole thing. Only right now the problem is there are too many varieties, segregation of plastic has become a big issue. But the problem with the fiber is, it is microscopic, you can never catch it. Not something that you can pull it out and do something about it. Even if you recycle your clothing, still the microfiber is already gone in big quantities. Mm -hmm. See, if you look at your clothing, what you're wearing, when this was new, how it was, mm -hmm. 
and after a little bit of use, after a year's use, you will see it's become thinner. So obviously the fiber is going away, even in natural fiber, I'm saying. The same is happening with polyfiber, but that fiber is not biodegradable. That's all the problem is. Yeah. Um, where do you see the planet uh, and our environment being in twenty years? Wherever we take it. <laughs> We're always thinking there is some other force. No, it's we. We as human beings. What is your fear? I have no fears about anything. What is the worst case scenario? <laughs> <laughs> so we as human beings, as a generation of people right now, you and me sitting here, we are a, a generation which is far more empowered than any generation ever. Never before survival was as well organized as it is today for us. Never before this was possible. This level of comfort and convenience, no generation has ever experienced. No generation had the ability to communicate as we can communicate. We are right now sitting here, the cameras are rolling. What does this mean? That means we can sit here in this room and make the whole world hear what we are talking. That's what it means, isn't it? Which was ever possible? There was no such thing possible ever. Not even twenty-five years ago it was possible. So with such a huge empowered generation, it is in our hands to see whether we will be the greatest generation ever or we will be a vain generation who only whine about everything and do nothing positive. This is in our hands. So this is very important that you don't ask for a prediction. Tell me what is the plan. I have a plan. In next twenty years, if we go by this plan, it will be much better than the way it is right now. For example, yesterday the statistics have come out, the Google Maps are saying, the planet is greener today, it is much greener than it was in the last fifty years. And most of the greening, almost eighty-five percent of the green, uh, the improvement of green has happened only in India and China. India and China accounts only for nine percent of the planet's land, but two-thirds or more of the greening process has happened mainly in India and China because the efforts have been on. Mm -hmm. We ourselves, called Project Green Hands, we started about eighteen years ago. Today, we planted over, uh, you know, thirty-three million trees and the green cover in our state where we work, it has uh, gone up at least by seven-point-two percent officially. In by Google Maps, it's gone up by eleven percent plus. So even in China, massive efforts by the governments have been done. In India, various private organizations have done a lot and governments also are beginning to do a lot now. As part of Rally for Rivers, the main thing is to bring back thirty-three percent green cover in the river basins. India is a land which thrives on rivers because it is probably the most agricultural country in the world is India. Sixty-five percent of the population today are involved in agriculture. So rivers are vital, but we have removed green cover in a big way in our uh, efforts to do whatever. You were speaking about uh, being an empowered generation. You have a million user, uh, followers on Instagram. I looked this morning, I was very impressed. I um, so. <laughs> do you, um, is that a platform you use yourself uh, to communicate with the world? Or do you feel like it came by sort of as a necessity of living in this modern age? See, the important thing is this, as I said, this is the first time in the history of humanity that we have this ability to communicate with literally every human being on the planet. So whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or uh, YouTube, every platform that's available, I feel the positive dimensions of life should be on it in a dominant way. This whole using these platforms became important for me when I was just talking to somebody who was some sort of an expert on internet. And I was just talking to him and then I asked, what are people looking for? Because I never browsed on the internet, I never looked for anything. I said, what is everybody looking for? Everybody's on it. 
Very casually he's saying, uh, Sadhguru, over seventy percent is all pornography. I said, what? Seventy hmm. percent is pornography? That can't be true. He says, Sadhguru, over seventy percent of the data is pornography. In this world there are so many things, but seventy percent is this. And they're saying some… Uh, some six million underage children are sold on internet every year. So when we have such an empowerment, is this how we are using this empowerment? It was really uh, painful for me to see that when you give a fantastic tool into human hands, this is how it first gets used. As we know, all the cutting-edge science, the first use is always military use, destructive processes. We don't use it for education, we don't use it for ecological well-being. No, first thing is military use, then only it comes to everything else. Yes. So even in internet, it's the same thing. So that is when I decided, we must go on a rampage. <laughs> Today we have over uh, five hundred million views on the YouTube. Five hundred million is not a good number for me. For me, the best number is seven point six billion people. It's not about me, it's not about this. This is our time on the planet. Are we… are we committed to make this the best time ever? Or will we just let this empowerment pass by and sell our children? It can't get any sicker than that, hmm? When you're selling children below twelve, thirteen years of age, uh, you can't get any more sick. This empowerment is totally against us. Any tool that's given to us, why are we using it against ourselves and our children? That is the future humanity. Right now, we want to mess them up so badly that they will not live a healthy life. They will not be productive human beings, they will become sick and suffering human beings. We are starting them on that. So I thought we should really exploit the social media platforms and we went all out. <laughs> yes, we <certainly> did. <laughs> um, what is a good daily practice for the spiritual novice? Um, what is the first thing that someone should start doing every day if they're seeking a better path? The simplest thing is this. One should become conscious of their mortal nature. Most people think they're immortal in the sense they always think other people die. They never understand they will die. It's not that we're wishing for death, but you and me will die one day, isn't it? People are not conscious about it. Once in a way when it comes home, either in the form of sickness or injury or somebody close to you dying, then they're shocked. Recently, <laughs> uh, he's a very… He's a sage in India who lived a, a complete life of service all his life from a teenage boy till he was hundred and eleven years of age. At one 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 he died just a month ago. And all the newspapers saying he suddenly died. <coughs> I couldn't keep quiet. I said, how can a hundred and eleven year old man, as great as he is, I bow down to him, but how can a hundred and eleven year old man sudden… die suddenly? Nobody dies suddenly. All of us have a death sentence the moment we are born. This is not to create some morbid fear in you. Only because you are not conscious of it, once in a way it comes home, there is fear about it. Mm -hmm. If you clearly understand you have a limited amount of time here, you will conduct your life very sensibly. If you understand time is ticking away for you, would you have time to quarrel with somebody? Would you have time to do something that doesn't matter to you? Would you have time to be in nasty moods and spend time being miserable? If you are constantly conscious of your mortal nature with every heartbeat, you're getting one beat closer to your grave, isn't it? Mm. If you see it as an awareness, not as a thought, if you're conscious of this, you will naturally become spiritual because what spiritual means is intrinsically your intelligence starts seeking what is beyond this body. Mortality or death simply means 
End of body, we call this khayantha in India, that means end of body. Body ends. So if body is going to end, what is beyond that is a natural question within us, isn't it? Once this question starts pricking you from inside, you will become spiritual. <laughs> if there is… if there's nothing specific you'd recommend, a meditation, a… No, no, they can do this. Tomorrow morning, if you wake up, see over a quarter million people don't wake up, all right? If you wake up, check you're still alive. If you're alive, give yourself a big smile because the most important thing right now is you're alive, isn't it? I wouldn't talk to you if you were dead, believe me <laughs> Even if you look just like this, nice and pretty, I wouldn't talk to you if you were dead. I'm talking to you only because you're alive, yes or no? Yes. Yes. So this is the most important thing. So tomorrow morning, from now to then, nearly quarter million people died, but you and me didn't die. So if both of us wake up in the morning, tch, great or no? <laughs> yes. Give yourself one big smile. No, no, but Sadhguru, my work, this is happening, my family, that's happening, my battery didn't get charged, my phone didn't get charged, that's not the point. You're alive, isn't it? So, whenever you look at your watch, whenever you check the time, just understand it's not the watch or clock which is ticking away, it's your life ticking away. So right now it's twelve-thirty, you're still alive. Hmm. Doesn't need… doesn't it need a little celebration? Huh? Yes. So from now on you just do this. Every time you check time, you become conscious of time, just give yourself a big smile because you're still on. Do not take this for granted because you're not going to be on forever. Just do this every day, let everybody do this, you will see how wonderful they will become. It's not about the smile, it's about the consciousness, yeah. that you're conscious that you're mortal, you're conscious that your time is running away. If this one thing happens, you don't even have to think about it. Mm. The, the deeper intelligence within you will start organizing itself in a different way. Right now, you have made your body, your thought and your emotion the be-all of life. You think your thought and emotion, maybe even body, no, nobody would like to think body, at least their thought and emotion is bigger than the cosmos, more significant than the universe. If this one thing goes away, you are naturally spiritual. Spirituality does not mean you have to look up or look down or chant some mantra or go to a temple or a church or something, no. Spiritual process means just this, your inner intelligence is awake. Mm. It is aware that you have a limited amount of time, whatever needs to happen, needs to happen now. This doesn't mean you party every night, that's not the point. What needs to happen is life, not party. Right now a whole lot of people, they can become alive only if they're on some chemical, otherwise they're walking around like living dead. That also is because they have forgotten. They may mentally know, but they're not conscious. Mm. So just do this one simple thing. Whenever you check the time, when you come awake, give yourself a smile. Whenever you check the time, wow, still, al still alive, all right? Huh? Five minutes gone, still alive. In this five minutes, how many people do you think died on this planet? Quite a few, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But see, you and me didn't die, isn't it fantastic <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it fantastic? It is. It is. So in the spiritual intelligence, where does the mind and the heart and the spirit factor, how do they interplay in what you're speaking about? See, we will keep the spiritual intelligence aside for a moment. Talk about mind and heart. See, what you're calling as mind and heart is thought and emotion, right? Right now, I think you're really a wonderful person. What kind of emotions will I have for you? Mm. Naturally sweet emotions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I look at you and I think you're a horrible person. Mm. What kind of emotions will I have? Nasty emotions. Mm. So the way you think is the way you feel. The reason why you think these two things are different is, because thought is agile. Mm. This moment I can think, oh, she's so wonderful. Mm. 
if you do one thing I don't like, I'll say, oh, she's horrible. Mm -hmm. But suppose my emotions have become sweet for you, it will struggle for some time mm -hmm. before it turns bitter. Mm -hmm. These days they're doing it pretty fast <laughs> Otherwise people would struggle because thought is very agile. Emotion is little sappy. It takes time to turn around. Mm -hmm. But it turns around, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Just a question of time. It does turn around. If I think you're horrible, ten days I thought you were wonderful. Suddenly I think you're horrible because you did something I don't like. Now, two days my emotion may struggle, by third day my emotion will agree with my thought and give you the necessary nastiness, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, this heart-head thing has been overemphasized. Yeah. The way you think is the way you feel. After some time, if the feeling becomes strong, the way you feel is the way you think. That's when you get fuzzy in your head. Because of your emotions, you can't think straight. So about a deeper intelligence within you, right now our education systems unfortunately have projected memory as intelligence. Yes, they have. You read a book and if you can repeat this book wherever you go, suddenly you consider it very intelligent. Mm -hmm. For a long time, this has been considered scholarship, this, this is supposed to be a great thing. Reading one book for a few thousand years, reading one book which is a religious book or whatever, suddenly that one guy seems to know the whole cosmos by reading one book. All he did was he read the book a few years ahead of you mm -hmm. and suddenly he becomes an intelligent man. Mm -hmm. This has to go. And that is going, technology is leveling this out mm. because now machine learning is coming. Uh, your phone knows… has more memory than you. My phone is supposed to have six hundred GB <laughs> So, your phone can do ten PhDs in a day, you understand <laughs> yes. So, this… this is the most wonderful time. That's why I'm saying this is the most fantastic time because you don't have to misunderstand information as intelligence. You know the dumb… the dumb thing has stored up everything. But when human beings stored up everything and spoke, you thought they were fantastic and intelligent. So intelligence, there is a dimension of intelligence within you where there is not an iota of memory. In the yogic terminology, we call this chitta. That means it's an intelligence without memory. When we say memory, we must understand this. See, why is this you are you and I am me? Because this is one kind of memory, that's another kind of memory, isn't it? Why is it if you and me eat the same food, you won't become like me, nor I will become like you. You eat the same food, you remain a woman. Mm -hmm. I eat the same food, I remain a man. Yes? Yes. Because here there is a memory in this body, where every cell in the body remembers this is this kind of a man. You give him whatever kind of food you give. I eat Italian all right sometimes <laughs> Whatever kind of food you give, the memory inside this body will ensure it only becomes like this. It will never get confused. So what you consider as myself, even physically, is just a consequence of memory. There is evolutionary memory, there is genetic memory, there are karmic memories, there are variety of memories which make you who you are right now. But there is an intelligence within you which is beyond memory. Mm -hmm. So memory is the possibility which has made you who you are as a person. And memory is also the boundary that you cannot cross. See, how do you consider somebody is your friend, somebody is a stranger, somebody is your enemy? It's all memory, isn't it? How somebody is your father, mother, husband, child, all by memory. People think there is some other connection, no. If I wipe out your memory, you can't even recognize your children. Yes or no? This is a fact. It's a fact. So, there is an intelligence beyond memory. What this means is an intelligence which has no borders, an intelligence which has no boundary. So there is a part of us which is creation. Right now, this is a creature. This is a consequence of memory. 
But there is a dimension of intelligence which is the source of creation within us, which is not bound by anything. So whole spiritual process means just that you access this dimension of intelligence, suddenly the sense of what is me and what is you is gone. Out of this many things happen because you naturally become all-inclusive, like the world, like the universe, which is all-inclusive. See, this whole thing about uh, memory creates, she's a good person, she's a bad person, all this I remember. If I lose my memory, I don't know whether you're good or bad, isn't it? Sun comes up in the morning, uh, doesn't shine more light on good people and less on bad people. Probably bad people are out ahead of others in the morning, they may get more light. <laughs> so, nothing in the universe is making this judgment. Nothing in the universe has distinctions except in the human mind. So, transcending that, knowing that this is a limitation which is functionally useful for us for day-to-day -day activity, but what is a possibility at one level is also a limitation on another level. To cross that limitation is the spiritual process. Thank you. I have no more for you. I'm <laughs> Namaste. I hope it's not too complicated. It's not complicated at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite simple. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is quite simple. And I wanted to ask you about Maya also. I'm sort of your feeling of illusion, but I felt like it's probably not relevant for. <laughs> your memory is Maya. <laughs> My memory is Maya. That's what I was thinking when you were talking. <laughs> yeah. And this life is Maya. It's your Maya. sense of. My sense of perception is Maya. Your sense of. Who I am is Maya. Yes. People don't get it till you bury them. Yeah. Even when you bury them, they don't want to get it. That's why they're in a metal coffin. Yes. <laughs> um, are we still rolling? Yes, we are. Oh, we are. Could I ask one more question? Yes, please? of course. Just the, in my estimation, the West has an understanding of Indian spirituality that is quite strange. Bizarre. Bizarre, it's a like colonized, <laughs> co-opted, uh, people are doing power yoga, it's completely strange. And it's, there's this idea of Indian spirituality as just being one thing. You know, this, this country is like a place of, of enlightened beings now. As Indians, we know that's absolutely not the case. It's strange perception. Um, in fact, there is so much complexity and... Uh, between groups and regions and languages and religious sub subsects and um, what is your take on 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 the West's appropriation of Indian spirituality? Are you, is it are you cool with it? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> is it like sure whatever you want? You make what you want it. Sometimes I you know I'll go to Kirtan and I'll feel completely colonized. Um, <laughs> but how, would, how do you feel? <laughs> well, I'm an Indian by birth but not Indian in my consciousness, mm -hmm. because consciousness is not Indian. My body is Indian mm -hmm. and I like it this way. <laughs> That's at one level. But uh, consciousness is not Indian ever. Consciousness does not belong even to this planet. It's just life. This is a living cosmos. Either you're with it or you become something that you invent. I'm using the word invent intentionally. Mm -hmm. Your nation is an invention that you made up. Yes. Your idea of nationhood, your idea of religion, your idea of sect and subsect and super subsect, all these are your inventions. Even your idea of family is an invention that you made up. Another Maya. Huh? Another Maya. <laughs> no, no, these days Maya is breaking up pretty pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> They're dealing with maya in their own way, <laughs> all right. <laughs> the important thing is this, to conduct the physical nature of our life, we make certain arrangements. Unfortunately, over a period of th time, mm -hmm. we try to slowly raise it to heaven. Marriages were made in heaven, I think they've stopped using that. Huh? These days they've stopped using it. They've stopped using it. Because 
<laughs> I think they've been a disaster only because they were made in heaven. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One hundred percent. If it was made here, we would know how to manage. This is a totally foreign product. You don't know how to manage. <laughs> it's an alien product, all right? right? Marriages is made in heaven means what? It's an alien product. You have no user's manual. You don't know how to manage it. Yeah. If it was made here, you would know how to manage it. Yeah. <laughs> you made by us, we would know how to manage, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, you're very funny, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about laughter. Well, if you, uh, you know, in Indian music, it's very common to use a bell. Yeah. There are many instruments. A bell cannot be played like a sitar or a guitar or a, even a drum or whatever. You cannot play a bell. You can only do dang. But you will see in the middle of music at the right moment, if a bell goes tang, mm. it's a completely different effect on you. There was a time Every town, every village in India, the first thing you would hear is the bell, not the calling bell like a church going da 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 da, you know, calling people, not like that. Simply, simply a bell would happen. So, what a bell is in music, laughter is in conversation. <laughs> but you should not laugh. It's very obscene to laugh. Laughter is a natural happening because of what's happening within you. If uh, this doesn't happen with Italian food much, if you eat Indian food, South Indian food, you will feel like belching. <laughs> Not because there is gas, because we eat very fresh food, there's no gas like that. But because you… people, when something is very tasty, they eat little more little higher than where it should stop, most people I'm saying. So, they belch a little bit to make space inside. They don't want to have any air gaps, they want to fill it nicely. It's a consequence. Similarly, laughter is a consequence of the way you are. But you think you must laugh or you even think you must smile. I think even a smile is obscene. Mm. Smile is a consequence of you being pleasant within yourself, mm. you're joyful. So smile will happen, when it goes little out of control, laughter will happen <laughs> What is a consequence? We try to handle like a process, mm. because the societies have become goal-oriented. Mm. No, you handle the process well, consequence will come <laughs>